Hello, this is Mark Homer and welcome to Mark My Words. Today I'm going to be talking about energy prices. It is a huge topic, especially if you have houses of multiple occupation where you are paying the energy bills. Maybe you've got commercial buildings, maybe you've got offices, um, industrial where you're paying the bills. Lots and lots of people have got factories, um, I know farmers. Uh, people who are producing, they've got food production facilities, um, all of their electricity and gas um, costs are, have gone up hugely uh, and until last week they were estimated to go up something like 800% since 2019. Let's just put that in perspective. I saw a lady in town like us um, she uh, was paying 11, 12p for her electricity in 2019, 2020. Uh, she just she runs a little shop. She got a quote for November for her new contract, and the the quote was 97p a kilowatt, which is something like 800% increase. Um, residential supplies are are capped at about 30p, so they haven't gone up quite as much. Um, but the underlying wholesale gas price um, means that, you know, if you are going for a quote now, it is something like 90p. So it is absolutely massive. Um, I was really, really concerned a couple of weeks ago uh, because our energy bills were going up several hundred thousand pounds. Um, and, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of stuff that you can do. That there's a the huge area that you need to focus on. Um, at the moment, I'm going through buildings, I'm finding ways of putting solar on them, uh, so that's PV, photovoltaic, photovoltaics, um, which provides electricity to those buildings for heat and for light. Um, probably will uh, provide about 30% of the electricity for the building, maybe feed a little bit back to the grid or put, put the rest into some batteries. Um, Payback now is very, very quick uh, because energy prices have gone up so much. It's looking like payback might be two and a half years, something like that, whereas uh, it could have been seven, eight, nine years prior to all of this starting. Other options that we're looking at are heating controls, in, especially in HMO properties. Uh, you know, tenants will come back, press a button, uh, and they'll be able to set the temperature within a reasonable band, you know, within a band of, say, 17 to 23 de degrees Celsius. Uh, rather than, uh, as lots of them do, they just set the temperature to 30 degrees and regulate the temperature of the room by opening the window. Um, so we're, we're sort of moving away from that. Uh, there are these little systems you can put in every bedroom. Uh, they keep the, the temperature nice, and then when the tenant leaves the room, um, it, after about an hour and a half, two hours, it drops the temperature down. If they open a window, it, it drops the temperature right down. Uh, if, the, if there's a, a period where the, the room is empty, uh, again, it drops it down. If the temperature drops too, too low outside, then it makes sure that the, the pipes don't freeze. Uh, and it can sense other things like um, tenants putting um, um, sort of fan heaters in there and other unauthorised equipment along with a humidity sensor. So I'm, I'm, I'm spending quite a lot of time on that at the moment because I think that is a, a big area that could potentially save another 30%. So you can probably you really focus on this with solar and with um, heating controls like that, the right ones, because I've, I've had you know ones that are centralised in, in the property and they don't uh, work off the temperature unit temperature in each bedroom so then some rooms are cold and some rooms are warm and, and that doesn't really work uh, but I think the two things combined you can probably reduce the bill by about 60 percent so that's huge. Lots and lots of people in factories uh, are obviously finding different ways to, to get their consumption down. Uh, I, you know I don't know exactly what's going to happen but um, last week huge announcement um, Liz Truss said that she was going to keep the cap on uh, residential uh, electricity and, and gas supplies so that um, residents are going to be paying uh, just a little bit more than they're paying at the moment. Um, so, you know, the, the, the cap at the moment means that um, people living in an average sort of three-bed house shouldn't be paying more than about £2,000 a year. 
uh, and the new cap's going to be two and a half thousand. So I think that brings the electricity price to something like 32 p a kilowatt. We haven't got that number yet, uh, and it probably takes the gas price to about eight or nine p per kilowatt. Just to give you an idea, clearly if it's a bigger property, it's going to be way more than two and a half thousand pounds a year. Uh, business, uh, well, with the residential, that's capped for two years. Uh, with business, um, the cap apparently is going to go on for six months, and then after that, it's going to be specific industries which uh, Les decides uh, are eligible, uh, which might be hospitality and pubs and things like that. Who knows what that cap is? She said she was going to set it around the current level, uh, but we will have to see. Um, you know, we're going to move into the winter and there are going to be uh, lots of people crying for support, I presume. 30% of UK households were not going to be able to pay their energy bills this winter, which is a huge number. It's 20 million people. Um, so hence the government has uh, decided to start another scheme. This scheme, they don't know what it's going to cost because who knows what gas prices will be and, and how much people will use. But... Um, they think it's going to cost something like £150 billion. Just bear in mind the furlough scheme is about £90 billion for, for, for some perspective. So uh, this is a huge deal uh, and um, it, clearly they had to act otherwise I think the recession would have been even worse. Uh, interestingly, some of them are saying that this is going to control inflation, maybe reduce it a little bit. I spoke to a bond trader at the weekend and he said, uh, I, I don't think that's true. The bank that he works at uh, believes that this 150 billion, this this new government scheme on energy, is net inflationary, and they think that inflation is going to hit 22% next year, which is absolutely nuts. Uh, we would never have believed it two years ago, but that is uh, where it looks like things are going. Um, so, just some ideas for your own home uh, to reduce uh, your energy consumption. Um, first thing you could do is turn down the thermostat, uh, only heat the rooms that you're using. Um, so turn the heating off, turn all the radiator TRVs off in, in the rooms that you aren't using. Bleed your radiators. You know, open those uh, little valves, let all of the air out so that you've, you've only really got, um, you've got less air in there and you've only got the, the, the water sort of flowing around, that will make them more efficient using a radiator key. Um, move furniture away from radiators, because um, furniture will absorb and block the convection, the heat that's coming from those radiators, so sort of rearrange your room. Maybe put some tin foil behind the radiators, uh, which will reflect the heat back into the room rather than heating the wall. Um, fix any drafts. Um, so you might have drafts under, um, and under um, doors, uh, you might have them, um, you know, if, you, if you've got sort of windows that aren't any good, uh, maybe around those. So, um, you know, let's stop those drafts. Um, close your curtains in the evening. That should stop some of the heat going out of the windows. Uh, and can, according to the University of Salford, it can uh, reduce the heat loss in your room by 17%. Um, and in the summer, conversely, keep the curtains open because it could reduce the temperature in your room. Uh, some other ideas that uh, have been muted, which uh, I find a little bit strange, buy USB gloves. Uh, so you can sit there sort of uh, uh, with your USB gloves on and your heated insoles. I think that might be going a little bit far, but you know, some people, if they can't afford to heat their homes, maybe this is another way. If you've got the money, double glazing, can make a massive difference. Uh, I know where I've put double glazing in my own home, it, uh, it, it keeps it so much warmer during the winter uh, and there's a big, big benefit there. In the kitchen, don't overfill the kettle because um, you're heating water uh, that you're not gonna use. Uh, lots of people leave too much water in there, heat it continuously uh, but, you know, and, and only use a, a bit of it. So um, that's not gonna be very good for your electricity consumption. Uh, saucepan lids, put them on um, because then uh, it's something like 10% less energy to heat the saucepan up. Keep your hob clean uh, because dirty hobs uh, and, and, and grease use more energy. Um, bulk cook in the oven. Uh, so, you know, if you've got some leftover space in the oven, uh, maybe you cook your meals uh, with, you know, the extra bits, maybe for the next meal. 
that you then just keep cold. Uh, keep the oven door shut uh, to make sure that um, you know you put enough heat through. Clean your fridge uh, because um, there's lots of sort of heat that comes out of, of the back of the fridge. The Freon comes through and, and dissipates it through that uh, sort of radiator system. Uh, and those condenser coils need to um, dissipate the heat so it doesn't have to work as hard and use as much energy. Defrost your freezer uh, is a good idea. Um, your dishwasher, you know, could be used more efficiently. So make sure you don't turn it on until there's a full load. Uh, use a washing up bowl, uh, which will reduce the amount of water um, and you know, unnecessarily heating the water is probably not a good idea. Uh, have a shower instead of a bath, Stand, spend less time in the shower. Change your shower, shed, shower, shower head for one that uses less water. Make sure you turn off taps, don't water the garden. Uh, turn off uh, lights wherever you can, put LED light bulbs in all around your house. Wash your clothes on 30 degrees. Uh, use a, a shorter washing cycle. Dry your own clothes outside. Um, switch, switch appliances off standby, you know that little red light on your TV, turn it off. Don't charge your phone overnight. Um, and look at energy ratings on equipment that you are buying. Um, make sure you program your boiler. If you are going to buy a new boiler, get a good condensing boiler. Uh, maybe a smart meter. Uh, because you'll only be paying for what you use. Submit uh, regular energy readings. Read it carefully because you can easily get overcharged. Uh, and pay your energy bill by direct debit because um, that reduces the cost of your bill. Consumer owner only energy deals can be good. Make sure you're paying the right amount of VAT. We had a lot of suppliers where we were paying too much VAT and we got a refund from that. Uh, see if you can claim any benefits. Um, you may be eligible for uh, additional support. Just have a look to turn to us or policy and practice or maybe entitled to to see the calculators to see whether you could qualify for some benefits. Look out for cost of living payments. There's 150 payment to those being made who can claim certain dis disability benefits. £300 for pensioners uh, in receipt of winter fuel payments and a one-off payment worth £650 being given to those who can claim certain benefits. In addition, we're all getting the £400 this winter off every energy bill. Make sure you've got that. Have a look on your bill. Um, there's um, uh, energy debt advice available from the NEA, the National en Energy Action, uh, Citizens Advice, Step Change or the National Debt Helpline. So this crisis has certainly made me focus on our portfolio and how we manage energy. Clearly with HMOs specifically where we're paying the bills, uh, I've mentioned that we're putting solar on and heating controls. In addition to that, uh, we may start uh, excluding energy bills. Um, not quite sure how we're gonna do that, um, but um, that may come uh, and splitting out the rent from various other sort of elements. So. We're, we're trying to encourage tenants to be more responsible uh, with their energy usage because uh, a lot of them, to be quite frank, don't care. Uh, and, um, you know, they're, they're quite happy to sort of just use energy uh, pretty um, frivolously because they're not paying the bills. Um, some people are saying, oh, they're not going to buy any more HMOs. Um, I suppose in the short term, that's probably a good thing. I'm, I'm seeing the rents increasing significantly. I suspect quite a few landlords will come out of that, um, come out of the HMOs, and I suspect you'll see big rent increases. So, um, I tend to take a, um, a minimum five, ten, but often a twenty-year view. Uh, so, I suspect it could be quite good to own HMOs because um, quite a few HMO landlords will come out. Uh, therefore, there'll be less supply, and the rents will have to react. Um, so, um, I don't quite see it that way. I think you have to. Um, you have to sort of ride the, 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 the leaner times um, in order to get the, the sort of extra, you know, the bunts later. You, you um, yeah, maybe, maybe it's not jammed today, it's jammed tomorrow. The last six years have had um, a serious amount of change, serious amount of issues, uh, and I, I, 
I can honestly say I can't remember a time we've had to move direction and, and work out ways to fix issues more than any time since I started investing in property. 2016, we had Brexit. We had all the uncertainty there, what was going to happen to house prices. Um, you know, we, we, there was a lot of concern around trade and a recession. Clearly, we had the pandemic, thought tenants were going to stop paying. Actually, that was uh, less of an issue, but we had issues with getting into properties. We were doing developments and where sites going to get shut. And then, of course, materials became a major problem. Uh, and off the back of that, uh, and then exacerbated in a big way um, through the war in Ukraine and, and, and Putin's squeeze on uh, gas supplies, uh, we've now got this energy crisis, so um, th there has been a huge amount keeping us busy. Um, and, um, you know, I spoke to a mate last week and he goes, oh, it just makes you want to bugger off. Just, 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 just finish the whole thing and bugger off. I've, I've sort of changed, changed the language slightly. Um, and, you know, that can be um, a, uh, a reaction uh, and some people would do that. Uh, but one thing to say about this is... And um, some, uh, lots of landlords will, you know, you, 2016 specifically, um, we had Section 24, uh, which was the government introducing legislation that meant you can't offset all the mortgage interest against the rent for tax purposes, which was bizarre. That, that was probably the biggest change for all this. So we all had to sort of move to limited companies. Um, we had um, stamp duty increases. And then there's been all the legislation on sort of EPCs and electrical safety checks and um, right to rent checks and everything else, all, all layers of, of, of regulation going into the, the residential investment sector, uh, which has put lots of landlords off. Um, and it's given us a hell of a lot more work. Um, so sort of to think, you know, you buy this stuff and, and then just leave it and do nothing. Well, uh, you know, through some periods that works, but um, certainly not uh, since 2016, really. Uh, it, it has been really busy. There's been so much going on. So, you know, for me, uh, I look at the, the other side of that. Uh, there are less landlords. There are, less, uh, there are landlords being leaving the sector and rents are really starting to react now. Rents are, uh, are needing to go up. This is, um, you know, this is the, the product of uh, government policy. The, the government created this by um, introducing Section 24 and, and you know, there's been quite a lot of sort of media bashing. Um, the, the government have seen it as a uh, an easy political win to sort of bash landlords and add regulation and increase costs in the sector, um, which is now pushing rents up and the tenants are paying the price. Um, it's uh, it's quite naughty of the government. I, I think they've they've clearly got you know clever economists in the treasury and other parts of Whitehall that will have explained that this. You know, if you, if you reduce the supply of um, properties in the private rented sector, this is going to be the result. They were told, um, clearly the industry told them as well, I suspect they, they ignored most of the industry. Uh, and now it's happening. It takes a few years to happen, but now we can see it. And there's all these um, calls for, for rent controls, and they've tried that in Berlin, and I understand they're having to dismantle that to some extent. They've had to dismantle some of the... Um, sort of Section 24 type rules in, in Ireland. Um, you know, these policies are catastrophic in a, in a, in a free market. Um, and, um, you know, the, the chickens are now coming home to roost. Uh, so, you know, I don't see all this as bad stuff. You just need to understand it. You need to stay ahead of all of the, the changes uh, and, and, and just work out how you are going to react. Just back to um, energy, some people say to me, why is it that the cost of electricity is going up so much? Because in this country, only 40% of our, our electricity is actually generated from gas. Um, so only about 40% of the electricity we use comes from gas-fired power stations. Um, therefore, 60% comes from nuclear, comes from um, wind, comes from solar, comes from oil, comes from... Um, uh, from, from, from sort of other sources. Coal, uh, they, you know, they're, they're going to restart the Drax power station, I think, and, and start burning coal again. So 60% is coming from all these sources, but all of those sources, um, the, the, the cost of buying them in and the cost of producing electricity from those sources hasn't really gone up very much. 
certainly by nowhere near the amount that gas has gone up. Gas has gone up over a thousand percent. So why is it that the cost of electricity has gone up so much? And, and the reason is that in this country, the, the gas, the, 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 the electricity price is almost completely pegged to the gas price, the wholesale gas price in this country. Um, it's linked to the highest cost of uh, production or, or the, the source with the highest cost of production, which happens to be gas. Um, and at the moment, I think government is trying to unpeg, they're trying to unpick that, uh, that link between wholesale gas price and the electricity price. Uh, because there's all these people who have, all these companies that have nuclear power stations and, and solar and oil and all, they're absolutely having a way. They, they don't need these um, sort of disproportionate profits. I'm sure they like them. Um, so there's a way through that and I think uh, it's complicated, uh, but somebody is going to work that out and I, I suspect we've passed the point of maximum Putin leverage. Uh, that probably happened a week or two ago. Germany's got, I think, their, their stores of, of gas now are, are something like 85% full for the winter. Doesn't necessarily mean they're not going to have power outages because uh, I, I think they probably are. Uh, and I think a lot of the, the rest of Europe have prepared um, and they've got their storage you know, levels up. Uh, interestingly, in this country, uh, our maximum storage is two days. We've got rid of a lot of our gas storage. So... Uh, but I think we probably have maybe slightly better supplies and we're, we're not reliant on the Russians in the same way as the Germans are. But of course, our gas price is linked to uh, maybe Dutch TTF and, and you know, wholesale European and international prices. So we still pay the price. Um, but, you know, it's that unpicking that I think is, is going on at the moment. Um, another point that I, I just want to make, um, don't know if it's going to happen, but I spoke to a, I was at a, a big wedding at, at the weekend and there's some really interesting people there. Another guy who um, runs um, a, a recruitment company here for commodities traders. So he is recruiting the guys who then go and trade gas, oil, uh, they might be trading you know, grain, but, but mainly they're, they're in the energy sector. So those guys know a hell of a lot about what's coming. They need to because they understand how, need to understand how the price movements work in those markets. And he's, he said to me that the ones he has spoken to are 100% sure that by the first quarter of 2023, uh, maybe into the second quarter, there will be power outages in the United Kingdom. So he was specifically talking about electricity and he said quite a few of them have already bought diesel generators for their homes. Um, so uh, I thought that was an interesting point. Um, you know, that's, you know, it, we, we've obviously got the winter now, we need to heat the homes. I, I think there is enough there to do that. Uh, but there may be electricity outages sort of first quarter of next year onwards. Uh, I suspect coming into winter 2023, um, uh, you know, the supplies will, um, you know, there'll be a lot more supply. They're getting old power stations running again now uh, because the price is so high. It's so profitable to, to do it. Uh, I, I mentioned Drax is probably going to restart. Uh, they're going to be burning coal there. Uh, and uh, I, I suspect the, the point of max, uh, maximum leverage for Putin will have receded somewhat. Um, and uh, I don't know, maybe he hasn't got that much left to bargain with. Let's hope so. I know Labour, Keir Starmer, some of the others more to the left of the political spectrum uh, have been suggesting a windfall tax on energy producers. And I think it's easy to get upset with all the, the guys that are holding all the gas and the oil. Um, but it's also interesting to just think about who owns the likes of British Petroleum, the likes of Shell, all of these energy companies, they're on the international exchanges. You know, British Petroleum shares are listed on the London Stock Exchange and uh, the owners of that company are you and I. If you've got pensions, you've got any funds, um, you know, maybe you've got a, an, internet, uh, a, an independent financial advisor and he, he puts you into funds and, you know, various different corporate bonds. Lots of those will be invested in the energy sector in these types of companies. And they'll also be linked to commodities as well. So the value of, say, gas and oil uh, may also be impacting your investments and your pensions. So 
Um, sometimes, you know, there is a, a cloud where every cloud has a silver lining and it, it's good to remember uh, that um, you're not necessarily losing everything because you're paying a lot more for your energy bills. Uh, you may actually own some of these energy companies. And I'm not saying it's a great idea to necessarily go and invest in them because the prices of these shares will already have um, these elements baked into them. They will already have reacted to the fact that gas and oil uh, have gone up. That will have happened a long time ago. Um, but um, if you already hold them and you hold these funds that you know own commodities and, and have shares in the companies that supply these commodities, uh, you've probably done reasonably well out of that. So it's good to look at all these things in the round on balance. Okay, so that's been my evaluation on the energy market. I hope you've got some value. Thank you and goodbye.